Maybe you've been uh, attended or uh, been involved in a certain program before where you tried to not attend at all. Uh, generally, what happens when that occurs is the teacher doesn't even know who you are, and you maybe don't even get a grade at all. In other words, you don't even get a zero. You just get an incomplete. You didn't even show up. Generally, attendance policies are such that the teacher, the one who's going to be allowing you to pass on to the next grade or the next level or to be certified, uh, expects you to show up, expects that you're going to be there to hear the instruction so that you can be qualified to move on uh, to the type of level you're seeking to obtain. Uh, well, the same is true regarding the gospel. The gospel is such that in order for us to know what it is we are uh, to be doing as Christians, we need to first hear what God requires of us, hear his message. Uh, sometimes folks get this idea that in order to become a Christian, uh, I need to go through a certain experience in my life where I feel very low and sad or unpleasant, and it's at that moment that I then can decide in my mind that I'm ready to be right with God, and therefore I'm ready to be right with him and am right with him. But that's not what we see in the Bible. In the Bible, we see that God's uh, commandments, God's instructions are to be taught. And as they are taught, they are to be heard. They are to be understood. They are to be comprehended and then ultimately acted upon. Uh, for example, we see scriptures given to us that quite plainly teach the necessity of hearing. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 17, we know that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And examples throughout Scripture, we see that folks who are ready to be saved, ready to be Christians, ready to be right with God, have proclaimed, we are ready to hear what God requires of us so that we can go to heaven. Turn with me to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. And notice the example here in Acts chapter 10, where someone and a family, a household actually, is prepared to be instructed, prepared to be in attendance and engaged as to what God requires for salvation. We see here the words of Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. And we see that Cornelius states in verse 33, Immediately therefore I said to thee, he's talking to Peter, and he says, And thou hast well done that thou art come. Now, therefore, are we all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God? We are ready to be instructed. We are prepared. We are locked in. We are buckled in. We are ready to learn what it is that God requires of his creation so that salvation can come about. Now, again, let's use our analogy. <laughs> Uh, no one can expect to pass a class and go on to a next level or be certified if they're not going to even uh, be willing to sit and learn and be taught of what it is that's required of them in order to reach that level. But yet sometimes, again, we get this idea that Christianity can really avoid instruction, avoid hearing, <coughs> avoid being taught of what God has required of us in order to become Christians. And such is just not the case. We need to learn. We need to hear because it is only by hearing that we can actually comprehend what God has required of us. Hence, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But notice also uh, similar language that is given in uh, syllabi, if you will, or syllabuses, uh, regarding uh, hearing. It's not just hearing. Hearing itself is not uh, adequate in order to just uh, go on through the class. But generally, there's a certain level of participation required. In order for a class to function, usually teachers will put some type of participatory, uh, particip participatory requirement upon the students. That they actually be engaged and actually reveal to the instructor that they are tuned in, they're aware of what's going on, they're actually questioning and asking and going back and forth with the instructor to make sure uh, that they're settling in on the right kind of understanding that is needed in order to go on to the next level, or in order to be certified. Here's an example of a syllabus regarding participation. Uh, notice uh, the following. Uh, number one, each person is expected to be an active participant and to make meaningful comments in class. Notice also, merely coming to class is not sufficient. Attendance is not participation. The requirement of the syllabus in this example is that the classroom, the students attending, not just simply be hearing, in other words, it's going, 
in one ear and out the other. I'm just simply here in the seat. But that actually there's a comprehension. Why is that so? Well, generally, instructors, when they're engaged with the class, are getting an understanding of what it is that ultimately they're settling on regarding their understanding. The instructors want to make sure that the students actually are comprehending a uh, clear understanding and comprehension of what it is that's being taught. And so engagement, actual participation, helps encourage that. Well, God doesn't want us to just simply hear the gospel and it go in one ear and out the other. You know, sometimes, uh, I've spoken to this recently, I think we do ourselves a disservice when we break down what God requires of us regarding salvation into just five steps. Hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized. Uh, because, yes, we do see that throughout Scripture, and that's fine for simplicity's sake. But let's not oversimplify it and fail to really understand what it is that God's teaching. He doesn't want us to just simply say, you know what, I've heard the gospel. Yeah, I've heard it mentioned before. Yeah, I've, I've, I've heard that. But actually wants a belief to exist based upon that hearing. And what belief is that? Well, ultimately, it's the belief that Jesus is God. In John chapter 8 and in verse 24, Jesus says the following. John chapter 8 and verse 24. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. The original there is just I am. If you believe not that I am, ye shall die in your sins. God stated in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 14, when Moses asked, who shall I say uh, that sent me? As Moses there is uh, conversing with God through the burning bush, God says, I am. You tell them that I am sent you. Jesus here is making a claim and stating who he is. He is deity. And unless we believe that Jesus is God, we are going to die in our sins. Well, what does a belief that Jesus is God what does that translate to? Well, it translates to us being subject to him. A recognition of his deity is then going to transition into uh, a life lived for him. Uh, Paul will state the following in Galatians chapter 2 and in verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul makes it very plain there uh, that he is being ruled, the one that uh, is dictating and determining the decisions that he's going to make in his life is not of himself. Paul says, yes, I'm still living, but the life which I am living is not of Paul, it's not of myself. It is Christ that lives in me. Christ is the one that is directing me in my life. Belief will ultimately lead to action because belief, true belief that Jesus is God, means that we are acknowledging the fact that I'm ready to be ruled by Jesus. Hence the reason why uh, we learn of language in the scriptures that uh, belief is not just a mental recognition of the existence of God. But true belief actually is uh, associated with works that uh, are evidence of that belief. James writes in James chapter 2 and verse 24, ye see, then that, uh, ye see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. It's the only place in the Bible we'll see the words faith only. Uh, some of our denominational friends like to say, well, we can be saved by faith only. The well, only time we see faith only in the scripture is that it's telling us we can't be saved by faith only. And in verse 26, James will go on and say, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. A true belief in God, a true belief that Jesus is God will translate into a life. That is evident based upon that belief. In other words, works that accompany the belief and the faith in God. Uh, Paul will say uh, in Acts chapter uh, 26 uh, regarding uh, what would transpire upon one's belief. And this gets us to the topic of repentance. Uh, the changing of one's mind. No longer to live based upon one's own will and one's own intentions, but now to live based upon the will of God. Uh, hearing the gospel, hearing what God commands, believing that Jesus is God, then ultimately leads us to repentance, to a change of life. 
a change of mind. And Paul will state in Acts chapter 26 and in verse 20, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God, notice, and do works meet for repentance. Folks, we truly haven't repented if we are not living according to the will of God. Here Paul is saying that works are going to be a display of one's true repentance. And this is again where our denominational folks take us off. Our denominational folks like to say, well, repentance is just, uh, I'm willing to turn away from my sin. I'm willing to just acknowledge that I've sinned before and therefore I've repented. Well, no, that's not what it is. Repentance is uh, evident based upon a life that now is producing fruitfulness that shows I'm not living by my own will any longer. I'm now living by the will of God. And folks, when we go to a class, uh, when we accept a syllabus in order to advance to the second grade, advance to uh, middle school, advance to become certified in a certain area of work, uh, just simply showing up and just simply being engaged isn't enough. A lot of times there's homework that's required. <laughs> there's cases that maybe we have to put a pen and paper to. And then we turn it into the instructor and we begin to show the instructor, hey, look, uh, I've been hearing what you've been saying. I've been showing up. And, and now here's the evidence that I'm actually comprehending and embracing what it is that I'm being taught. Instructors then begin to look at those assignments and begin to grade them and begin to uh, ascertain whether or not the student is capable of being qualified to move on to the second grade. Being qualified to move on to middle school or become certified in a certain area of work. Because that's the opportunity to prove oneself. And see, what we have today is a belief in religion, a belief in, quote, Christianity, uh, that I can show up and I can actually tell the teacher what the syllabus ought to be. In other words, I can show up and I can tell God what repentance is. Uh, well, God, I understand what your word says. I understand Acts chapter 26 and verse 20. And I actually must do what you say if I'm really repenting. But I don't like that very much, God. I want to hold on to my own life and I want to do what I want to do. And I want to define what repentance is. That's like going into a classroom, writing the answers to the homework and a certain assignment, and putting whatever it is we want to put that may have nothing to do with what the teacher has actually taught us throughout the class. And then expecting that the teacher or the instructor is going to pass us and allow us to move on to the next level. Folks, it's never going to work in secular society. No one is going to accept that. Not in government work. Not in the private sector own small businesses, not in the public school system. We don't get to show up and tell other people what we want the syllabus to say. It doesn't work that way. If we want to pass, we have to align ourselves with what the syllabus requires. And we understand that in these other categories. But for some reason, when it comes to spirituality, for some reason, when it comes to religion, we still want it to be our way. We think we're going to get into heaven. Folks, that's just not what the Bible teaches us. Repentance is something that we have a lot we can learn about. Am I really willing to do what God commands me to do, or am I still trying to do what I want to do? That's the question. We also have the commandment that we must confess. In other words, that we must publicly declare, we must be willing to say, I am a believer that Jesus is God. I believe that he is God. In Romans chapter 10 and in verse 10, Paul writes the following there. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Notice, Paul doesn't say, well, once you confess, you're saved. Sometimes folks love to go to this verse and they like to say, see, confession has to do with salvation. True, it does. Confession absolutely has to do with salvation. But confession is not the only element regarding salvation. 
Notice here that the words are, confession leads one unto salvation. Again, let's take the analogy we're using here of that of a syllabus. There are elements required that go into one's ability to pass and move on to the next level. And sometimes those include projects. Uh, I always struggle with projects, especially at a younger age. I was one of those that would stay up till you know, 3 or 4 in the morning trying to work on the project, get it all ironed out. And then you'd always have to go in front of the class and you'd have to explain yourself to the class and try to you know, make sense of what it is that you put together and make sure that the teacher accepts it and hope that you get through it. What ultimately are you doing there? You're further uh, revealing to the instructor the evidence that you know the material. <coughs> I am standing before a class, I am standing before uh, the instructor, and I am actually proving that I know this so well, I'm able to voice it. I'm able to proclaim it. But folks, let me ask you a question. If we were to take that syllabus and look at all those things required, attendance, participation, repentance, uh, belief, hear, confess, we were to look at all these things and align them with the syllabus. Uh, if we were to begin to then ask ourselves, well, uh, if I just do the project, if I just simply uh, ignore all the other elements of the class, ignore the tests, ignore the quizzes, ignore the assignments, ignore the homework, ignore participation, if I just simply do the project, will the teacher pass you? No. Because we know that these syllabi, the way that they exist and set up, ultimately there's weights given to each element that goes into the grade that ultimately will determine whether or not you advance or get certified. And if someone were to go in and say to the teacher, you know what, I just want to do this part only. <laughs> uh, you know, I got a busy schedule, I don't want to show up, and I certainly don't want to engage and participate, and I don't want to hear too much of what you have to say, I think I can go figure that out on my own. And uh, I'm certainly not going to take the final exam. I don't want anything to do with that final exam. I have test anxiety. Just get me away from that final exam. But you know what? I'll do the project. Uh, can you advance me to the next grade? Can you certify me? Do we have a deal? We all know what the teacher would say. But folks, sometimes people get that idea about salvation. I don't want to hear anything about the gospel. I don't want to hear what God requires. And I don't want to believe that Jesus is God and actually uh, act upon that belief based upon him being the ruler over my life. And I certainly don't want to be baptized, which we'll get to in just a second. But you know what? I'm willing to confess. Why do we think God is going to act in a certain way, different than the way in which our teachers and instructors would act here in this secular world? Folks, this is eternal salvation we're talking about. And we recognize the importance of all these elements when it comes to certification or grade school. We don't argue with them. We just do them. But yet when it comes to the most important thing in the entire world, our eternal salvation, we think we can make a deal with God and tell him to ignore his word and be untruthful in regards to what he has said is required for salvation. Confession is a requirement. 100% yes. But confession is something that others have engaged in. As a matter of fact, we learn in the scriptures, Luke chapter 4 and verse 41, even the devils confess. Even the devils acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God. How far does that get them? It's not enough, folks. It's not enough. Confession ultimately leads one unto Salvation, But let's talk about that final exam for a second. Ultimately, you have these weights, but then ultimately it really boils down to that final, right? You get some homeworks and some participation grades, and then that final is the, oh, man, that's the one you stay up all night and cram for, right? And you go in and you hope you've studied enough. But regardless of how well you've done on all those other areas, the final is usually, not always, but usually always weighted in such a significant level that the final is required to be taken. Even if you get a 100% on every other aspect of the grade, 100% on every other aspect of the class, that final is the last proof 
your last chance to say, I'm committed to this course. That's generally how it's weighted. Well, folks, God has told us something very similar regarding baptism. Baptism is the point at which we enter into the kingdom becoming classified as saved. Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21, The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. You can't get any more clear than that. Baptism saves us. Baptism saves us. On the day of Pentecost, when Peter was preaching there, the Jews realized what they had done in putting Jesus to death. And they asked Peter, what shall we do? In verse 37. Peter responded and told them they needed to be baptized, every one of them, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of their sins. They had to be baptized. Now, notice, however, that that baptism needed to be based upon something. Clearly, these folks had just heard the gospel. I mean, Peter had just given it to them, verses 14 through 36. He had just laid out for them what God required. Clearly, now, they recognize uh, who it is that they just had uh, sentenced to death. The Messiah, as Peter had just said in verse 36, Let all the house of Israel assuredly, uh, know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Guess what? He's God. You just put him to death. They recognized that based upon their question then in verse 37. What shall we do? Clearly they're willing to make a change. They're willing to say, you know what? We don't know what to do. Tell us what to do. We're ready to do what it is we need to do to be right with God. But folks... At the same time, they couldn't have just simply ignored all those other things and just walked up to Peter and said, can I just be baptized in water? I don't really want to hear any of this other, uh, these other details regarding the gospel. I don't really want to know much about Jesus, but I've heard if I'm baptized, I'm good to go. Can I just go ahead and be dunked in water? That wouldn't have worked. Baptism saves us when it is based upon all the other elements having already been met, which is why Peter, when he writes in 1 Peter chapter 3 and in verse 21, that baptism now saves us, but he, 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 he further clarifies this, not the putting of the way of the filth of the flesh, notice, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In other words, someone who had been taught what needed to be done in order to be right with God and is answering based upon that teaching, is answering based upon their conscience, being convicted that they're ready to be saved. Baptism only saves when it is built up by one having heard the gospel, believing it, repenting and confessing that Jesus Christ is God. In a very similar way, if one were to go and look at that syllabus, just as they would maybe for confession, just as they would maybe for a project being given, that was our analogy there, they couldn't go up to the professor and say, you know what, I don't want to attend your class, I don't want to listen to anything you have to say, I don't want to present any projects, but just go ahead and give me the exam. If I ace the exam, can you let me pass this class? Well, the exam is weighted heavily, but folks, it ain't weighted that heavily. The other areas are still required. And so we understand this regarding secular things, but sometimes we struggle with it regarding spiritual things. Now, in regards to certification, let's just take a certification class for a second. Uh, usually, just being certified isn't enough. Generally, what else is required? <laughs> Continuing education, right? That's a lot of fun, isn't it? But what ultimately are those who certified you in that work trying to determine? Do they still have a clue as to what it is they are doing? You know, they were taught a long time ago. But are they actually doing what it is that they were taught? Are they actually still able to still be classified as being certified to do this specific work? And so generally, based upon the profession, certain types and certain amount of hours are required to continue one's education to prove that they're still engaged in the subject area. Well, folks, the same is true with us regarding a Christian. God doesn't say become a Christian, your ticket is punched, you're now good to go, go sit on the sidelines. 
Becoming a Christian is our ticket to begin engaging in our purpose in life, which is the kingdom of God. Ephesians chapter 3, 10 and following. And so God then has commanded us that we must continue to live faithfully, even if it means being faithful requires us to be persecuted for such. In Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10, John the Apostle writes the following, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. God says you need to be a practicing Christian. Even if it means practicing your Christianity will eventually yield your death because of your faithfulness. You must continue to be faithful. Maybe you're here this morning and you're not yet a Christian. You've recognized that you've been certified, maybe in a certain profession. You've recognized you've advanced to certain grade levels in your life. You've recognized that certain requirements were demanded of you by those instructors. And you also recognize that you were putting God and the most important decision in all the world, salvation, as of a lesser importance than those classes and certification areas. If that's the case, friend, we're here for you this morning. We want you to obey the gospel. We want you to become a Christian, to repent, to give up your old life, to confess in your belief in Jesus Christ, to be baptized for the purpose of having your sins remitted. But brother or sister, maybe you're here this morning and you recognize that you haven't been engaging in your continuing education. You've been forsaking the assembly. You've been avoiding Bible class. You've been not showing up to worship. You've been not engaged in serving the Lord. You've been thinking about your own self and trying to tell God what the rules are. And if that's the case, won't you make the decision this morning to come back home? We're here for you. We want to pray for you. We want to help you in any way that we can. We want to surround you with love. If you need prayers this morning from the congregation or if you need to be baptized for the remission of your sins, won't you come forward? As all together we stand and sing.